questions I want you to consider are, what happens when you're 80 before you inherit from your parents? Or 80 before you inherit from your grandparents? And let me tell you, there are probably alive today grandchildren who are in their 80s. I recently did a Radio 3 phone-in, and a woman rang up and she said, I'm 70, my brothers are in their 80s, and our, moth our mother will not die. <laughs> now, that was a sad statement to make, particularly on radio, but she had a point. She felt that her 80-year-old brothers were never going to be head of the family. They were always going to be the child in that kind of a relationship. And that's really the kind of thing that I want to talk to you today, things that are actually happening now. And in fact, I want to talk to you about, to start with, incremental longevity. Life expectancy over the last 200 years has increased across the life course. First of all, we conquered infant mortality, then child mortality, then we started to extend the majority of adult lives, particularly women's lives, well uh, into midlife. And now, quite unexpectedly, I have to say, we're really extending life post-65. So much so that we're actually adding on five hours a day. And that means that those of you who've staggered through two days of IQ squared have about 10 extra hours, either in the daytime or the nighttime, to play around with. And that is the reality of where we are at the moment. Really serious demographers are modeling future life expectancy for the people in this room. Uh, Varpel's group in Berlin, for example, have pointed out that half the baby girls born at the end of last century will live in three centuries. So my daughter, who was born in 1996, has a really good chance to make it into the 21st century. And indeed, they've just announced that the 2007 birth cohort has a life expectancy of 103. And then you look at the kind of serious science that's coming out of uh, Oshansky's group in Illinois. And they have pointed out that if we can conquer the major chronic disease, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, then we will, at a stroke, add 12 years on to normal life expectancy. And that is very likely to occur by the middle of the century. And that means that those countries who currently have life expectancies for women of, say, 88, will, at a stroke, raise them to 100. So incremental life expectancy is here with us today. And I think one of the really interesting questions that I'm going to come back to at the end of the talk, this is the um, Seven Ages of Man statue here in London. As we're going to live longer and longer lives, are we going to have more ages? Are we going to have eight, nine, ten ages? Or are we just going to stretch each of those ages out? Now, there's been a huge interest in the last three, four years in particular on centenarians. Uh, Ten years ago, we knew very little about centenarians. We had a few key studies, but people really were not focusing on those over 100. Uh, but now, suddenly, there's this boom in interest of people over 100. And this is the reason. This is an ONS graph. Uh, this is not wacky science. The ONS has predicted that 10 million people living in the UK today, that's 20% of our population, roughly, will make it to 100. We currently have about 11,000 centenarians. We will have half a million centenarians by 2050. And we are predicted to have one million centenarians by the end of the century. And that means that when the Queen is sending out her telegrams, or probably her emails, or writing on somebody's wall, in about 2040, she will be having to send that to about 50,000 people a year. And I say the Queen, she was born in 1925. In 2025, she is actually very likely to reach a century. And it is also possible that she will be one of the new super centenarians, those people who reach over 110, 115, maybe even 120, and will still be sending out telegrams by 2040. And this, remember, is incremental longevity. What about radical longevity? One of the problems with radical longevity is it has a bit of a bad press because, to say no names, there are people out there who claim that the first man to live a thousand has been born, which I think is highly, highly unlikely, but is a useful tool to stretch our minds out to the realms of impossibility and then come back. 
A lot of money is now being put into age retardation research, trying to understand if we can identify the gene for old age, the gene for aging. And yes, there are organisms on this planet that seem to live forever, potentially. The hydra, it's a little organism who lives in water, and it seems to constantly reproduce its cells. It's made up almost exclusively of germ cells, those cells that constantly reproduce, and if it's kept away from predators, in theory, it can go on forever. Now, we do have germ cells in the human body, but they are basically focused around the reproductive organs because that is how we use them. Our germ cells is what we, what we use to produce sperms and eggs and therefore reproduce the next generation. The rest of our body is constantly uh, waging a battle between reproducing our cells in order to repair and not reproducing too much so that we don't develop certain types of cancer. So there's a real issue about whether we really can stretch life out to 130, 40, 50, et cetera. And definitely things like nanotechnology and the new genetics have got tremendous potential. One of the problems, however, is the institutional framework and the fact that these would have to go into clinical trials for 20, 30 years, et cetera. But there is something that I think we already have, and it's this, and you heard a little bit about it when the meat man was talking. It's stem cell research. And one of my colleagues, uh, Paul Fairchild, who runs the Stem Cell Institute at Oxford, has pointed out that, of course, he doesn't work on longevity, he doesn't work on age retardation, but exactly what he is doing is the science to help bits of the body replace themselves and regrow. And in doing that, he is actually working in the field of longevity. And this science is out there, and it is being used. And I think one of the major breakthroughs that we've recently had is now the ability to be able to grow uh, muscles and fibers and ligaments and even potentially parts of the skeleton itself. Because we've known for a while that we can actually uh, regrow organs, but what would happen to our bodies? Would they not just simply collapse and fall apart? But this technology that is out there and is being used has the potential to really start over the next 20 years or so, pushing back uh, our longevity, way beyond the incremental longevity uh, that I uh, mentioned. And of course, in the meantime, nanotechnology, genetic research will be catching up. So actually, who knows by the end of this century uh, where we will be. So to go on to the um, implications of this, uh, I talked a little bit about something called generational succession at the beginning when I gave you the story about uh, the Radio 3 interview. This is a newspaper cutting from a newspaper uh, in Australia. 1955, five-generation family, so huge that it actually made the press. This is now one a penny. There are five generational families all over the world, and in fact, if you look at your own families, you probably will find within your extended family that you have a five-generational family. My husband's family definitely has one line, his cousin, they are part of a five-generational family. And then we come on to looking at some of the social implications of this around this idea of generational succession. We have a society that is based on the idea that we will pass down power and wealth and assets down through the generations at a certain pace. But as I say, we're entering a world where we're not going to inherit from parents or even grandparents till we're in our 80s. That's our families. What about our workplaces, our economies, our politics? our societies, etc. How are we going to have to change those to accommodate these really, really long lives? And what about the life course? Uh, Stephen Webb said at the beginning of the year that soon we would have people who lived a third of their life in retirement. I think that's impossible. We're not going to have people who are going to be living to 100 and 120 and actually retiring at 50. We're going to have to rethink our life courses, and we're going to have to do it quickly because it's happening uh, at the moment. And the idea that we're going to have a period of time in education and a period of time in work and then a huge period of time in retirement and leisure is actually something that I think uh, we will soon find we move to a more fluid kind of life course. But of course, this is not the first time we've been here. We, if we look back historically, women in particular, 200, 250 years ago, their life expectancy was in their 30s because many, many women never made it beyond pregnancy and reproduction. You only have to read Jane Austen's autobiography or a biography about her. 
where in fact she talks about her female friends. She died at 40, unmarried, no children. All her sisters, cousins, and close friends had died in their 30s, 20s and 30s, in fact, from child uh, birth complications. And so one of the reasons why we have had this feminization of the workplace uh, and women entering the labor market and a real change in our society in the 20th century was because it wasn't just that women weren't having children and therefore could go out and work. They weren't dying. They weren't dying through childbirth issues. And we've already had to adjust our society, therefore, from dying in our 30s to living three times longer and heading uh, well into our 90s for many, many women now in this, in this country. And as a consequence, the idea of changing a life course from being three score years and 10, was it, 30 years ago? Then it was 80. Now we're talking about life courses of 100. We really probably are going to be able to adjust if we have to find ourselves in a society where we're living 120 or 150 years. But this, I think, is probably actually going to be one of the really important questions. Uh, I think a, a, a really big issue um, for us to consider uh, is around the idea of maximum life expectancy versus natural expected life expectancy. Are we going to have this kind of a situation where the couple over here uh, who are fit and healthy, they're in their mid-80s, they are married, they live independently, they have a very good quality of life, and I know because it's my parents. <laughs> and over here, we have this child who, in Africa, Sierra Leone, 35 is still the life expectancy of a, child, of a young boy born at the moment. And are we going to have a world where we have a few, I used to say, rich Americans buying themselves 150 years of life. I think it's probably now rich Chinese, but that's another point. In a world where actually the majority of us, and an increasing majority of us, are still dying with disease, etc., in our 80s and 90s. And so I think they're the two really, really big questions that we have to look at. Going back to that seven ages of man, how are we going to change our life courses. Uh, I recently talked to um, at the City of London Boys School. Uh, I thought it was a sick form talk and it ended up being a talk with 12 year olds all the way up to 18. And not quite clear how they were going to cope with ideas around longevity. I divided them up into two uh, groups. And I said, you, you're going to live till you're 50 and you are going to live till you're 150. And bearing in mind that when you're 12, 50 is actually so beyond the pale, you probably can't even contemplate what you would do. How are you going to change your life courses? And a little boy sitting in the front, who was 12, put his hand up and said, if I'm going to live till I'm 150, I'm not going to start having kids till I'm 80. And actually, he was thinking the right way, that we really probably are going to delay a lot of our life transitions if we're going to be able to live 120 and 150 years. And the one big question that I know is probably sitting there, because it's the question that I think about a lot, are those 150 years going to be healthy or are they going to be frail and disabled? And at the moment, the science is telling us two very different stories. It's telling us that we're pushing back healthy life expectancy so that men in particular who are currently in their 70s have a far healthier life ahead of them for the next few years than they did 20 years ago. But it's also telling us that the science that is driving longevity is also enabling us to keep frail, disabled people alive longer and longer. So I just leave that question with you because I think it's a big one. And then the second question is, how are we going to deal with this science? Is it going to be in the hands of the few who are going to push to 150 whilst the rest of us, and particularly still in places like Africa, we have huge infant and child mortality? Or is it going to be something that we can all grow up with uh, looking forward to long, long lives of 100, 120. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah Harper. For more big thinking about the future, go to iq2if.com.